we'll begin. I gave you this script to run. Um, so let's make sure it runs. <coughs> there, mine runs. Looks ugly because of the display. And we're going to make this into a, a GUI right quick. And in fact, I wonder if I can, yeah, sit here, let's do this. Because I want, I want to demonstrate for you some things like uh, storing data in the GUI so that you don't have to recalculate things over and over again. So I'm going to close this and do the usual thing, type guide to make a new GUI. Here's guide. Let's bring out an axis. Right, this is all in support of your project. So, okay, there's the new axis. I'm going to name it something that I can use. So, tag. There's that. Uh, I'm going to make a run button, so I'll find this button and we'll just bring it out so that we can make it calculate whenever we want it to calculate. I guess we'll, let's, I'll call it calculate. And the tag I'll call it PB for push button and calculate. And just to make that more legible for you, size 18 times and I'll save this and we're going to call this something like I don't know I'm gonna call it demo <coughs> GUI something like that and I'll hit save. Okay, so there it is. I have figure and I have M file. And I'm, I have to go back to my script that I gave you. And I'm going to make, I'm going to turn it into a function. You know how to do this. Um, this is a good starting point, right, for when you want to make GUIs. First, you make a script or a function that works nicely and then you can start wiring it up to a GUI. So um, I'm going to save as, and I'm going to call it demo FDTD GUI, and I'll call it engine. And we're going to do some things here. So like we have to turn it into a function. So function, function name. What, what input do we want this function to have? There's one special input. What is that? Handles. So that it can access the controls we put on the GUI. So I, I put in this function header here, and we're going to put an end statement at the end. Uh, you can put it, there's some stuff I commented out at the end, and we'll just go end, save that. And then uh, we, there's an, another thing. We're going to look for a plot command because we want our function to plot in the, the um, GUI. And actually, it was a p color command, so I'm going to type uh, command F, and I'm going to look for p color. Looks like that came in at line 72. So what I need to do is, or 73, so before the, I call a new figure for the, for the script, I'm going to comment that out, and we're going to make the current axes be the, the main fig that we define. So I type axes, and then give it a handle, right, handles dot um, axes main, is what I called it. So. There's the function. Uh, I'm going to just copy its, its uh, name and invocation 
whatever information. I'm going to go back to the GUI and I'm going to put it in the opening function because the opening function, I want it to evaluate right off the bat. So there's the opening function. We're going to put our, our paste my calculation engine invocation right in there. And I'm also going to put that same function call in the callback to the push button, which happened at the very end. So if I go and hit run, there's my GUI. It calculated, that's good. It put the figure in the right place. Um, we're not going to worry at this moment about some of the things, because you can, you know how to put in text boxes to control the, the time and the, um, you know, the number of samples and all the other stuff, the position, you can, you know, control the start position, you know all that. What we're going to work on now is a cursor, uh, a time cursor. So I'm going to show you how I generally do that. So the first thing I do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to draw a cursor. So I go back to the calculation engine, and at the very end, the very end of the uh, plotting and the visualization, I'm going to put a hold on, and then I'm going to put, um, I'm going to make a cursor line, so I'm going to make it white because it will show up nicely on that background, and I can say, uh, I'll call it time cursor, and I type plot, and let's make it go from, initially it's going to go from uh, x, and we're going to go from x1, and it's going to x end, so mind you, this is logical subscripting, when I, I put in these brackets, the, the one and end, or I guess, sorry, it's not logical subscripting, it's numerical, but um, it's I'm picking out two points that span x, and then we're going to, for now, we're going to set it at 0 and 0 in the y direction. And I'm going to make it white, so I'm going to make the color be the RGB triple 1, 1, 1. And then I also will make it a dotted line, so I, I'll type line style, and then in single quotes I'll put a colon, that'll make it dotted, and then I'll make the line width 2, and this is going to show up, it's not going to show up very well um, when we put it in because it's going to sit at the bottom of, this, of the plot. I'm going to type hold off, and then we're going to go back to the GUI and we're going to hit the calculate button, and it calculated, it took a, a moment, but you can see in mine there's this dotted white line at the bottom now. So we want to be able to reuse that line. So what we're going to do is, well, we saved it as a variable, but we want it accessible in the GUI. And the way to make it accessible in the GUI is to save it in the GUI using the set app data function. So I'm going to put in comments here, store uh, a handle to the cursor in the app data. So set app data and the first input is the figure that you want to store it in. And so we can do that by, um, who recalls how we can do that? We can get the, the figure that we want to store it in. GCF, get current figure. And then uh, we have to give it uh, a name in the figure. So I'm going to call it time cursor. That's the easiest. And then the, the data that's stored there is the data in time cursor, which, of course, is the handle to that line. OK, so there's that. Um, 
here's the time cursor. So what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to want we're going to put in an edit box that's going to help us to select the time step that we want the cursor to, to be at. And then we're going to want to define a function for the callback of that edit box that's going to uh, reposition the cursor. So that's where we're going with this. I'm going to go back to the GUI and I'm going to bring out an edit box. And for now, I'll set its, uh, its string to 1 because uh, that, that corresponds with a 0 time step. And I'm going to call it edit uh, time cursor idx for index. It's kind of a long name, maybe a bit unwieldy, but it's clear. Um, it's always a trade-off. You know, do you, do you go for the ridiculously long name which gives clarity um, or brevity. I, I like to get a balance of both. Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to save that. Oh, I'm going to make that a little bit more legible. 18 times, and then save the GUI and. Now we need um, a function, so let's let's call a function or let's make a new function, and uh, I'm going to call it demo fdtd GUI underscore update time cursor, and again its argument should be handles. And so I'm going to save this function. And what this function needs to do is it needs to uh, retrieve the cursor index from handles dot edit uh, time cursor idx. I think that's what I called it. Let's double check. Yes, that is what I called it. Um, and then it needs to uh, adjust the uh, the y position of the cursor. And so now you might be wondering. Well, how is it going to know what y position corresponds to the cursor index? And that's a very, very good question. It can't, so we have to give it some more information. So let's go back to our, our calculation engine. And in addition to this time cursor data, let's store some time data because um, if we store the time vector, we can correlate an index value to an actual time value. So I just copied and pasted that line, and, and the time variable is going to be somewhere here. Um, it's the output of the finite difference time domain function. Um, so it's just t. And let's see how I plotted it in p color. Oh, look, in p color, I plotted. I took it, multiplied it by 1 to the 15th, so it must be that, yes, t, t is in seconds, but we're plotting it in femtoseconds, so the, we have to keep that in mind. So GCF, I'm, I'm going to save it as, maybe I'll call it time data, and as a cue to myself, I could call it um, femtoseconds, and then this is just, the, the data we're going to put in there is t. Or we could even say, uh, yeah, let's multiply that by 1 to the 15th. Okay, so 
we're, we're storing it in femtoseconds now. And we'll go, um, let's go back to the time cursor function. So let's, let's fill in some of the details here. So to retrieve that value, or the cursor index, I'm going to write, um, let's write time index is, uh, it's going to be a string to num, or better yet, yeah, string to num is good. And then uh, we have to get, and what are we getting from? We're getting from handles dot edit time cursor idx. What is it we're getting? We're getting the string, <coughs> bless you. And then we're converting that to a number. Okay, that's good. And then the uh, we also need to retrieve the time data and the cursor handle. So uh, let's go. I'll put that up here. Let's say retrieve the cursor handle from the figure. So for that one, we're going to say time cursor equals get app data. First input is the figure we're going to get it from, so GCF. And then the name of it is time cursor. Okay. And let's get the time data. Um, I'm copied and pasted, but I'm going to make it time data is get app data GCF, and I think I called it time data femtoseconds. Let's just double check. Yes, that's what I called it. So we've got our cursor, we've got our time data. We've got the cursor value itself. And then we, go, we need to adjust the y position of the cursor now. And the way that you can do that is um, we'll make a, uh, let's, let's make it a time cursor position. We'll set that equal to time data, but which value we want it, we want to index it using time idx. And then we're going to adjust the cursor's y data. So the way I do that is I set, um, I say uh, set time cursor and then y data, so capital Y, capital D. And the y data should be just as long as the x data. If you recall, I plotted this using two points. So there are two x points, two y, two x values, two y values. So to do this, I'm going to feed it. Um, the y data has to be a, a uh, what a two, or sorry, a one by two vector, and I'm going to give it. Um, I'm actually going to reduce this. Let's reduce the length of this. Just why not? Time cursor pause. That's good enough. We'll call it time cursor pause times one one. That makes it the right size. Okay, so I think that function is going to work and let's just see how that works. Uh, oh, but the other thing we need to do is we need to copy the function's invocation. We can get rid of its output. It doesn't need any output arguments. Um, I'm going to copy it so we can paste this as an invocation in the GUI itself. So that, uh, that function needs to be called in the callback to the cursor. And let's see if, how that works now. Um, I have to close this GUI because 
it doesn't have the new cursor built into it. Go back to the guide window. And there it, it's calculated it. It's drawn it. Let's see if this works now. Let's put in um, 20. Oh, look, it works. 20, 50, 75. That's good. Now, we can put in some other things because uh, you want the, you know, you, you don't want the user to go beyond the valid range of, uh, of indices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in, well, let's go back to this engine really quick. The engine, as you recall, it evaluates many more time steps here in NT then there are actual time samples. There, there are just 201 time samples, but like lots more time steps. So what we can do is let's bring out an edit box. Uh, to do that, I'm just going to copy the other one. Just copy it. So Control C if you're using Windows, I think. Oh, that didn't work. Uh, maybe Control D for duplicate. Yes, Control D. For Mac, it's Command D. And I'm going to call this Edit Num Samples. And maybe in the tooltip string, I'll put in number of time samples. And I'll close that. It's helpful to give it a label. So I'm bringing out a label, a static text, that is. And we'll call it, uh, we'll label it as, you know, something like number samples. Uh, it doesn't really need a name or a handle because we don't need to set it making it more legible, size 18 and times. There's the label. Um, the value of this actually should probably be, we'll set its default to the default that we used in the program, which was 201. And then if you like, we can, we can uh, copy this text box. Um, it may be, you may think this is a little bit cheesy. It might be, but it's okay. You can actually, I put it in here because there may be ways you can use this later. Um, I copied it over here, and we're going we're gonna to give it a handle, and it's, it's going to be um, text num samples. So there's an edit num samples and a text num samples. Um, and we're going to fill in its default value as 201. So that's a little cue to the user that, um, hey, maybe there are only 201 time samples that you can choose from. And then we, you, later on you can use this one, you know, the, the text box or the edit box. Um, you can use it for input checking however you like. but. We're going to save this and we'll, we'll wire it up so that the GUI can work with those a little bit. Um, so going back to the, let's go back to the engine. Just make sure that the number of samples comes from the, the edit box. So that's going to be um, num to string get and then handles. Um, edit num samples and we're getting the string and what we can do to make sure that the that the edit box or the text box is you know stays linked and updated we can say um, 
well, we can go to the, the callback. Yeah, well, let's just do it here. Let's say, let's um, update text num samples to match edit num samples. So the way we do that is we set handles text num samples string and then num to string ns like that. And then we go back back to the GUI, um, close it, open it again because we've added new things. Oh, now I've got an error. Bum deal. Let's try this. Oh, okay. It didn't like that because I, I should have gone string to num. That's I think that's what should have done. str to num. Let's see how that goes. We get an error. Oh nope, it works. That's good. So if I change this, let's let's try that. Let's make it 301, and I hit enter, nothing's going to happen, but once I hit calculate, it's going to calculate, and then now you see, okay, it's updated there. Uh, that's good. Um, now, let's see, now we know, okay, so let's, if, if I enter 50 or 100, that's great. 200, fine. But what we don't want is we don't want me to exceed 301. So let me just work a little bit um, of input checking into the text box. I think somebody had asked about this last time. Let's work that in a little bit. Um, and then what we'll, we'll tr what we'll do also is we'll, I'll show you how to get uh, instantaneous uh, plot of the probability distribution um, at the time of the cursor. So yeah, let's do that really quick. So first the so the input checking of the the edit box. I'm going to do this. Let's see. Oh, I got to go to the GUI and edit num samples. That's the callback. So let's do input checking and then um, so let's say Say um, new. Oh, it, it's not edit num samples. That's not what we want. It's uh, it's edit time cursor. That's the one. So before we update the time cursor, I'll put in some input checking here. So new sample value is uh, we're going to get h object because we can refer to that that object is as h object in its own callback and we're getting the actually I'm just going to like right up here the, the hint it says that right I'm going to copy this and that's the new sample value but we want to check it and so we can say something like let's get um, num samples equals uh, that's going to be string to double so I just copied from above string to double get, but it's not h object now. It's handles dot text num samples, right? And then so the the logic here is um, if new sample val is greater than num samples. Then we're going to set new sample val to um, num samples, and then we we also have to update the text box. So.
so that because the say the user entered in a million and uh, well we haven't done anything to address that problem yet so we had to change the the user entered invalid value back to a valid value so we will go and um, type set um, h object and string and it's going to be num to num to string and the string is the new sample val or or I could I could just use num samples that's okay but let's use new sample val So there's that input checking. Um, notice I didn't add any new um, new controls to the GUI, so I should be able to just uh, modify this. So let's try 400. Oh, that didn't work. 301. It, it denied my request. But if it's in range, that's okay. You know, 20. Now you could also you could just as easily put in something to handle the zero case. That's probably a good idea. But let's show you how to get an instantaneous value of the probability distribution based on the cursor position. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go back to the engine. And here, um, we, we calculate the probability distribution, I think, somewhere, or psi. We calculate psi. Uh, it's the output of the fdtd function. So I scroll up, there it is. We're gonna store psi in the GUI. So to do that now, I go and take set app data, I copy it, and I store psi t in the GUI. Now that data is stored in the GUI and we don't have to um, recalculate it. I'm going to bring out another axis. So I'm going to compress this one just a little bit so we can fit in another axis. Um, I can even command D or control D this axis and I get a new axis like that. And I'm going to call this axis um, we're going to call it, I don't know, we'll call it time snap shot, whatever. Okay, because it's going to represent a time snapshot of the probability distribution. So, we've done that. Okay, so, well, if we move the cursor then we're going to want to change this picture. So we, in the cursor update function, we might as well include the update to this, um, to this little plot here. So going back to the, uh, the cursor update function, there it is, update time cursor. Um, we're now going to add a section that updates the, the uh, I think I called it time snap, oh, we called it axes snap shot figure. Let me just double check that's what I really called it. Axes time snapshot. Okay. So in order to do that, we have to retrieve the psi data. So we take psi t is get app data and um, gcf and psi underscore t. And then we're going to want to plot the probability distribution. So what we do is um, we're going to get, I'm going to make a probability distribution <coughs> at some time t, 
and that is going to be equal to um, psi underscore t and uh, I guess we need to pick the time index so so we it's going to be uh, time cursor pause and all columns I think or it might be the other way around I'm not entirely sure um, let's just double check let's see what we can learn about this so let's look in my finite difference time domain and let's see how I stored the data Looking in there, um, help is nice. That's why I wrote a good help function. So it looks like it's, um, I guess this should say ns, where so the number of samples and then the number of x points. So each row is a time sample and each column is an x point. So okay, going back to the update cursor, I did that right. I'm sp picking out a specific row taking all columns. Um, it occurs to me we probably also want x data. So um, let's store x data in the, the figure before we move on with that. So I'm going to go back to the engine, the calculational engine, and we're going we're gonna to find the place where we're storing things in the, the figure. And uh, I'm just going to copy this last line, paste it, and we're going to store uh, we're going to store x data. That's that's a bad name, I guess. Let's just call it x and x. Save that, and then go back to the update time cursor. So we pulled out a specific um, value of psi. How do we turn it into a probability distribution? You can tell me. Okay, psi, psi is not a probability. Like it's, yes, dot times conj. Dot times conj, the same thing, right? Like that. And now we can plot this. Oh, well, let's, let's get, let's retrieve our x data. So we're going to say x equals get app data gcf x and now we can we can uh, make the current axes be handles dot axes time snapshot and then we say plot x prob, dist, and then the things I like, um, line, width, two, and uh, grid on, and then we're going to put in x labels, um, so x label happens to be um, x in <coughs> nanometers, we're going to set the interpreter to be LaTeX, and we're going to put in uh, font size like that. And let's now I think that ought to do. I may get an error, but let's see what we can do. Let's see if it runs. Oh, well, I need to close this GUI because it doesn't have the new user interface elements that we added. Um, there it is. Make sure I save it, run it. And notice, okay, it just did the calculation. There was absolutely no reason for it to update the cursor yet. Let's see what happens if we update the cursor. 20. Oh, it works. Um, 
That's good. 50. Now I get an error. Why? Why, why, why? Don't know. So let me try 20 again. It seemed to work. Let me do some troubleshooting. Clear all that error. Let's put in 50 again. What didn't it like? Subscripts must be real positive integers or... Okay. So I'm going to go back here and let's see what um, what's the issue with time cursor pause. I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Time cursor pause. So the, the issue is, time cursor pause, you're right. It, it's not a number, like it's not an integer. What I really want to use is time index, right? So that's the way to index this, is time index, time index. And yeah, let's go back, let's test that again. So if I put in one, goes down to the bottom, 20, there, 50, 200, yeah, because 200 were up here, um, 100, 150, yeah, that's pretty decent, I guess. And then let's put in uh, a Y label, because why not? And we'll put it in the psi. Oh, so y label should be psi x t squared. And yeah, run this again. One hundred. There's the y label. Doesn't look good on this screen, but whatever. Um, I guess it would be nice if, if when we first run the GUI, it updates this plot. So how do you suggest that I make it do that? Yeah, we can put the update cursor in the opening function. So I'm going to copy its header there so that we can invoke it in the opening function. There it is. Yeah, and then other things you can do, right? Um, you could connect this to a slider. Or you could connect that cursor box to a slider. Um, in that case, you want to be careful because the slider can have all sorts of non-integer values. So you might want to round its value so you get an integer. Um, yeah, what questions do you have about those techniques? We showed you how to save stuff in the GUI, retrieve stuff from the GUI, um, make a cursor, do a little input checking. What else do you want to know? Yes? So, so why did you decide to save the different versions in the GUI? Output variables. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the way the reason I did that was because uh, um, so I called the calculation engine at one point and uh, I, I stored in the GUI so that, you know, I stored results from that in the GUI so that uh, individual callbacks for the, the various things um, can just get it from the GUI instead of having to run the calculation over again, I guess. 
It, does, yours doesn't have to calculate each time you want to. No, I guess I just find the first and the other. Like, the first and the second. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it works, fine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah what other questions <laughs> are there? Yes. Oh, okay. Are yours interfering on your computer? Um, oh. Yeah, I can make the windows bigger. The other issue here is the resolution of this screen. So it normally doesn't look this bad. Um, but nor yeah, normally it'll, it'll look better. So, um, but if you get something like this, well, the way to do it is to make the, the font size smaller, and then, the, then this isn't going to interfere with that so much. Yes. Uh, in your calculations you're doing, uh, yeah, sure. So uh, at the near the very top, can you run? Oh, sorry, that's not. There it is. Okay. I was it went to the GUI. Oh yeah. So NS uh, equals the string to none, and then you actually go back and. Set handles in this one too. Is there a reason why you decided to set text none samples in the calculation menu instead of the callback for the uh, edit none samples? Um, yeah, I guess the reason I did that was because um, if I don't recalculate, so if I don't hit the the calculate button. In the GUI, it's still stored with the old number of of samples, so that's still valid. That's that's why I did that. So with that line of code, uh, I see what you're trying to do there. So with that line of code gone, the callback for the pressing the calculate. Yeah, it could have quite easily. Yeah. Okay. And then, is there like a canonical place to put that? Or yeah, I, I don't think I don't think so. I mean. Um, yeah, you could have, so I mean basically the callback invokes this function, so you could have just moved it one level higher in the, the control hierarchy, and that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I, I don't see advantages one way or the other, I guess. Maybe maybe this way it keeps the, the GUI itself a little bit cleaner, you know, the, the GUI, the M file in the GUI, but, yeah. What else? Um, I've been slow. I haven't updated the, the one on the video yet on the switch case and the, the pop-up menus. Are you guys struggling with that one, or is that OK? OK. Maybe I'll, I'll try to get that up. I'm, I'm, there's just this massive report I'm trying to do for Monday. It's, uh, yeah, it's big. Right, what else do you guys want to know? Okay, well, I guess that's all I have for you today. Um, have a really great weekend. Be cool. Not that I have to tell you that, but... <laughs>